On July 21st, 1861, after several months of minor skirmishes like the ones I described, for example, at Rich Mountain, the two sides engage with each other in what is the first major battle of the Civil War, known in the South as the First Battle of Manassas, while in the North, it's remembered as the First Battle of Bull Run. The second is going to be fought a year later in August with pretty much the same result. The Confederates will prevail. What distinguishes Manassas from the previous battles or skirmishes that I had um, described to you were the number of, of, of dead. Um, at Rich Mountain, there were 46 Union casualties and 300 Confederate casualties. At Manassas, the Union suffered 2,896 casualties, while the Confederates had 1,982, a total of 4,878, twice the number in a single day than all the Americans killed in the entire Mexican-American War. This was the first time ever in history that the United States suffered more than 1,000 casualties in a single battle, let alone a single day. And, and that number, 4,878, shocked both Northern and Southern um, people, media, the public. A year later, these numbers would seem minor compared to the 23,000 casualties that will occur at Antietam. September of 1862, the highest single battle casualty rate ever suffered in American history right up until today. You're looking at a road known as the Sunken Road, where um, Confederate soldiers were caught in a Union crossfire and, and just massacred in this roadway by massive fire directed at them by the Union. And just to give you some sense of what 23,000 casualties in a single day mean, um, we can look at, for example, the Second World War, uh, Normandy, the D-Day invasion of uh, France in June of 1944, 6,603 casualties. Um, one of the most difficult battles the Americans have ever fought, um, Iwo Jima, 26,000 casualties in six weeks. Here again at Antietam, you get um, 23 casualties in, in one day. You know, this kind of casualty rate is incomparable to modern warfare, certainly for the United States or the 46,000 casualties at the Battle of Gettysburg in three days in July of 1863, or 7,000 casualties in 20 minutes at Cold Harbor in Virginia in June of 1864. Um, and, 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 and so these are massive amounts of casualties. And, you know, in the end, of course, they will add up to 620,000 dead or 2% of the entire American uh, population. More casualties in the Civil War than 
had occurred in all the wars that the United States had fought since the War of Independence all the way into um, Iraq and Afghanistan. If you add them all up, that's including World War II, World War I, the Korean War, uh, Vietnam, um, the Spanish-American War. Uh, it, it, when you add those casualties up, they still do not add up to these massive casualties of the Civil War. And, and, and so the question becomes why and one of the major answers to that question, of course, is the musket, the rifled musket. There, you can see it lying by this soldier's head. Um, here, again, you can see casualties at Marie's Heights in uh, Virginia. And, and you're looking actually at... Um, the side that won the battle, the Confederate side that lined up at uh, top of Marie's Heights and fired over that stone wall from uh, these kind of um, kneeling trenches that you can see, you can almost see as well a, 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 a kind of groove cut into the trench so that soldiers can rise up and kneel, fire over the wall, and then duck down again and reload their um, rifle. And the rifled musket, the technical name for that weapon, although we refer to them now just as rifles, um, the rifle musket is going to be one of the leading causes of death of soldiers in the Civil War, certainly one of the leading weapon causes, because what we'll see is that disease will actually kill more uh, American soldiers on the battlefield than, than, than the rifle. But compared to, say, World War I casualties, where big gun artillery caused most of the casualties in the Civil War, it is going to be the standard infantry weapon, the rifle that um, all the soldiers uh, carry. So what is it um, that makes the rifle particularly lethal in this era? And it's a number of components that line up behind these casualty rates. Um, <clears throat> probably one of the phenomenon that that do uh, lead to these casualties is uh, one future lag to um, the um, backwardness of medicine and the inability to develop new battlefield tactics in response to the evolution of this new rifle, uh, this new weapon. And a future lag, it's a, it's a, it's a term that, um, you know, Alvin Toffler introduces in, in his study of the shift between industrial civilization and our current civilization. Um, he wrote uh, a book called Future Shock and the Third Wave, looking at the various uh, kinds of societal conflicts and issues that occur when um, industrial revolution began to clash with the current information age uh, um, civilization. And what future lag refers to is a kind of inability for institutions or sciences or um, certain artifacts or machines to catch up with um, more rapid advances. So, for example, we have this in the 19th century between, in the United States, between 1840 and 1860, we have this 20 year period where infantry weapons uh, develop and radically advance in their capabilities between the Mexican-American War and the Civil War, but medicine 
typically does not, uh, nor do tactics, nor the strategy of the battlefield. Um, all those other elements lag behind the scientific advance of the rifle. And, and so that's the term essentially future lag um, as things don't, don't catch up to the current advances in other uh, fields that um, advance way beyond other areas. The use of muskets, smooth bore muskets, and a smooth bore you'll understand a little bit better when I describe to you what rifling is, but a smooth bore essentially means that it's um, like a water pipe. Essentially, it's smooth inside the, the, the bore. There is no rifling cut into it, as, as I say. I'll, I'll show you in a minute what rifling looks like. A gunpowder has uh, existed for approximately 700, 800 years in, in Europe and earlier in uh, China. In fact, China is the origin of um, European gunpowder. It traveled from China through the Islamic world and made its way to Europe. Um, it began to replace longbows and crossbows by the 15th and 16th century throughout Europe and essentially as well uh, puts an end to knights in armor as, as a musket ball could certainly pierce traditional medieval knight armor. The musket would fire a single shot. It would have to be load it through the barrel, through the muzzle, the hole in the barrel out of which the bullet comes out. Um, and, and so these kinds of weapons are described as muzzle loading weapons. And again, every time you fire one shot, you have to reload the weapon entirely. And the process of reloading is very complex and um, involves a number of steps that a soldier has to take, often under fire. Here, you can see the process of reloading conducted by Chinese infantry. This is um, a, a kind of an ancient sketch. Again, um, gunpowder originated in, in China, as did uh, muskets. And, and here you see the process of um, Chinese infantry reloading a, a weapon. And um, each soldier kind of represents one stage in, in, in the process. So we have, um, what, five? So 15 steps that have to be taken by the soldier is to load his weapon. So um, the first thing he would do, you can see at the top, he will place his rifle butt down with the muzzle um, just to his side here at the top. He then uh, pours gunpowder into the muzzle. He will uh, use a ramrod to pack the gunpowder down. He will then drop a ball, a round ball, literally. Uh, that's why we call bullets today often rounds. There used to be, as I say, like a small lead ball. He then tamps down the ball with um, the ramrod. He may as well put on top of the ball either a wad of paper or um, a cloth wad so that the ball doesn't roll out of the barrel. The cloth kind of keeps it packed down on top of the gunpowder. So he has to load a very precise amount of gunpowder, pour it down the barrel, then the ball, then the wadding, paper or gain or cloth, tamp down with the ramrod, the wadding, and then he has to prime 
the weapon where the hammer and trigger are. That's what he can see. You can see doing further down this line. Um, he has to pour again a small amount of gunpowder into the pan near the trigger and the hammer and secure that gunpowder. Often the gunpowder is a different grade than the gunpowder that he had poured down the barrel. And that's when he's ready. And, and then he pulls back the hammer, pulls the trigger, the tr trigger releases the hammer, which strikes the firing pan, which ignites the gunpowder that he had poured in the pan, the gunpowder exploding in the pan, then sets off the gunpowder he had packed in the barrel and the projectile, the ball now flies out. And, and so this, as I say, has to be done in uh, combat. It usually, in, um, with the older systems, it would take approximately a minute to load this kind of uh, muzzle-loading smoothbore musket. So, um, and again, you're doing this under fire. Here, um, you can see a uh, flintlock type rifle. And again, um, there is uh, the pan. And, and so uh, he had already packed the gunpowder down the barrel and the ball and the wadding. And then again, he takes a separate pouch, pours a measured amount of gunpowder into uh, the pan. And the hammer, of course, is going to strike this part here called um, the freezing. And as the hammer pushes and rubs on the freezing, it opens up this pan of small, fine gunpowder and, and, and pours sparks down there, which sets it off. The first type of development that was occurring throughout history in these kinds of weapons was this firing mechanism. The first type of uh, mechanism was called the uh, matchlock system. Here, uh, a soldier would have a lit cord almost like a cigarette running off the hammer. And when he pulls the trigger, the lit cord would set off the gunpowder here. This, of course, is very problematic. It uh, means it's difficult to fight when it's raining or in humidity. Um, it's, um, of course, makes it impossible to be fighting at night, although uh, night fighting was not something that was frequently done until the 20th century. Uh, but nonetheless, it, it makes it virtually impossible because, of course, you would see these lit matchlocks in, in, in the dark if you engaged in any kind of firefight. Here is a kind of a photographic representation of a matchlock weapon. And this is essentially how it is igniting the gunpowder. Um, imagine as well, you're under fire, you're being attacked, maybe um, there are soldiers charging you and you have this lit matchlock and you're trying to pour new powder into this uh, pan around the matchlock carefully making sure it doesn't ignite prematurely or blow up in your face so it's a it's a difficult uh, weapon the next um, development in this kind of technology was um, the wheel lock. I, I don't have an illustration of it here, uh, but the wheel lock essentially worked like an ordinary lighter. There was a clockwork-like mechanism that uh, when you pulled the trigger, a spring would release this um, mechanism that would spin and like a lighter cause a spark that would detonate again the 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 weapon um this is in a way revolutionary because it meant that um you no longer had to keep a burning um cord it also meant that um 
you be, you can now conceal handguns that um, have wheel locks on them. Um, you couldn't conceal a handgun with a cord, you know, burning, say, under your jacket. Um, but um, a, a wheel lock handgun, that you can do. And, and so the invention of the wheel lock now triggers this kind of crises of concealed arms being carried in Europe. So it's a kind of a Renaissance era weapon. The problem with the wheel lock, of course, is that one, it was very expensive uh, because it needed kind of um, a, a skilled, almost clockmaker to make the wheel lock mechanism. As well, it broke easily and um, needed, you know, repair that was expensive, and and so wheel locks really weren't extensively used. They were unreliable and and fragile. The next generation, let's say the third generation, would be the flintlock, which I think many people are much more um, familiar. In, in this case, you had a, a kind of a vice here where you would tighten in uh, a flint. And um, again, um, I've already explained this. I'll do it one more time. Uh, when you pull the trigger, the a hammer strikes this part here, the freezing, the gunpowder you had poured, the igniting gunpowder, the priming gunpowder into the pan here. And so when you pull the trigger, the uh, hammer hits the freezing and pushes along the freezer, opening up the pan and again, showering sparks down into the pan, igniting the gunpowder that um, one would have loaded through the muzzle inside the uh, barrel, like that. There's with the freezing open, minus a flint that would have been screwed in here. And the flint locks are going to be used certainly in the War of 1812. Um, they're going to be used in the Mexican-American War in um, the 1840s. They're, they're, they're used in the American Revolutionary War. They're, they're probably the most ubiquitous muzzle-loading um, smoothbore that um, was around. The next advance is going to be the percussion cap um, firing system. And, and here you can see a Civil War era rifle. What um, happens here is a metal percussion cap with mercury fulminite inside of it is just dropped on this portion here called the nipple. And when the hammer strikes it, it um, will then detonate and again ignite um, the gunpowder and uh, ball ammunition and wadding that had been uh, muzzle loaded into the chamber. The percussion cap, of course, um, depended on chemical advancements and um, manufacturing ad ad advancements to produce this kind of explosive cap. It uh, increased the rate of fire. Uh, percussion caps, of course, are more impervious to humidity, to rain and, and, and so forth. And um, it takes only uh, maybe a second to uh, load a percussion cap. And if you look at Civil War era soldiers, you often see on their belts, they're wearing a different size um, uh, uh, pouches. And the bigger pouch would be for the actual ammunition they're firing. A smaller pouch would have the percussion caps. The other uh, advance that is emerging almost in parallel with the percussion cap is the cartridge. 
Um, now, rather than uh, pouring gunpowder out of a gunpowder horn or some kind of container for gunpowder, we get the ammunition and the gunpowder pre-packaged in a carefully measured amount of gunpowder. And, and so what the soldier would do at this point is he would bite off the top of the paper cartridge. He would um, pour the gunpowder or empty the gunpowder out of it down the muzzle. And then he would uh, push in the paper and the round with his um, ramrod into the, the muzzle and down the barrel of, of, of the weapon. That too now increased the speed of loading because again, you don't have to pour um, the gunpowder, the wadding and the ammunition in three separate moves. It all comes packaged together. Um, that's the reason that soldiers who did not have, um, you know, were lacking teeth for example, they were exempt from military service because they couldn't bite open this, this um, uh, cartridge. It, it also, of course, um, produced this revolt in India of local Indian soldiers serving um, the British colonial occupation there um, because the paper to make it easier to slide down the barrel was often greased with animal fat, either lard, pork fat, or tallow, beef fat. Um, and of course, the, the great Sepoy Rebellion, the Indian First War of Independence in 1857, um, was a result of these new cartridges being distributed to Indian soldiers who were either Muslim, for whom pork is prohibited, or they were Hindus for whom beef fat tallow um, is, is uh, prohibited to, to eat as, as, as cows are regarded as sacred to Hindus. And, and, and so just this one little technological innovation causes this massive rebellion in the British Empire in India in 1857. What um, these pre-rolled, pre-packaged cartridges mean, of course, now is that soldiers are carrying ammunition with them um, almost as if there were uh, bullets. Um, they're, as I say, pre-packaged. They would um, carry about uh, 40 cartridges with 40 uh, percussion caps. I uh, imagine a few to spare if a percussion cap misfires, but they would carry 40 uh, normally into a battle. If it was going to be a particularly drawn out or heavy battle, they could carry um, 60 cartridges, but they're quite heavy and they're, they're quite large as well, we'll see. So beyond 60 cartridges, you're getting a lot of weight to, to carry into, into battle. The rate of fire, of course, now is um, going to be increased with cartridges. With cartridges, you can, an average soldier, can perhaps load three cartridges a minute. A very good, highly skilled soldier, a say sharpshooter, could probably load may, as many as um, five in a minute. So we're we're talking about um, loading in this complex way, one shot um, every twelve seconds. And, and, and again, that depends upon, of course, the introduction of uh, percussion caps that cuts off uh, at least 20 seconds of setting up your firing pan and, and um, as well cartridges that make the muzzle loading much quicker.
here you can see again British soldiers with the famous brown bess, um, the the flintlock smoothbore musket, which again is used as the standard weapon right into the Mexican-American War. Although there were some soldiers armed with, um, again, rifles, but I'll look at that once we start talking about uh, rifling. The problem with these weapons is they were very inaccurate. First of all, the ball that you had to drop down the barrel in order for it to um, get down to the bottom of the barrel, the ball had to be slightly smaller than the diameter of the barrel. And, and, and so in the case of a smooth bore barrel, the ball would kind of bounce around inside the barrel and, and wobble. And um, it, it was very difficult to hit anything that you were um, aiming at. It had an effective range of about 100 yards at best. And really, um, at, at, um, often the bullets would miss. And so it required accumulating and massing all this fire. That's why you had ranks and ranks of soldiers opening fire, kind of scatter, you get a scatter gun effect as, as, as soldiers are firing row by row into the enemy. And a lot of the um, ammunition is going to miss, but some will hit. So it's kind of like rolling a dice, whether either your, your shot is going to hit where you directed it or, or, or not. So um, 100 yards is, as I say, the um, effective rate of uh, fire from that kind of weapon. And, and so 100 yards, if we superimpose it um, over the kind of the campus area here, you can see in yellow Young Street and then Gould Street where Ryerson is. You can see 100 yards runs from the corner of um, Dundas and Gould to about the bookstore doorway um, at the corner of Victoria Street and, and, and Gould. That's 100 yards. Right there. If you increase that rate, so so at a hundred yards, a smoothbore musket will have an accuracy on average of eighty percent. In other words, out of a hundred shots fired at a hundred yards, eighty percent will hit their target, twenty percent will miss. When you double that to two hundred yards, which is I guess approximately to the next block, to Bond Street, the accuracy now drops to 64%. Almost half of the shots fired at 200 yards from a smoothbore musket will miss their target. And if you go all the way to Church Street, between from Young Street to Church Street is approximately 300 yards. At that distance, um, the weapon is only 18% effective. Out of um, 100 shots fired a distance of 300 yards, only 18 will hit their uh, target. And so warfare essentially consists of massing as many men as possible in lines, several ranks deep, and getting them within 100 yards of each other. And, and so let's say blue is defending and red is advancing. They would um, advance at each other and probably not try to fire their one shot um, until they get within effective range there, say 100 yards. And sometimes they'll fire at each other over this 100 yard range um, the first side that runs out of ammunition and is still standing is the victorious side. Sometimes it's 
simple of that as that. More aggressive commanders will, of course, um, try to bring their soldiers in closer to their enemy, to their target within the hundred yards, so they can unleash a more effective fire at them. And, and, and so the trick here is often to get the other side to fire their ammunition. Um, the other side, of course, has a choice. They can fire all three rows can fire at once, or they can fire row by row. One is reloading, the other is priming, while the other one is firing. But that, of course, means you're firing less shots. So again, it depends on the commander and, and the circumstances. But the idea is, is, is to try to get your enemy to fire the first round at you as early as possible in your 100, mile, in your 100 yard advance. And um, that's why they beat drums, they um, carry these standards and flags and banners and um, give a, a, a war cry. Um, it's often meant to intimidate the enemy and try to get them into a state of fear that they fire their shot their first round early in the stage of the advance. So let's say here at maybe um, 80 yards, they fire. And now these guys have to reload. And, and these guys, in the meantime, can advance a little bit more, closer now, and then unleash their fire. And hopefully, of course, as these guys are reloading, these guys had advanced, the red had advanced, and now have um, a much more effective distance to take out more of their targets in the defending blue side, say like that. At this point, nobody else has time to reload. And, and so what the red would do at this point is charge the, with um, unloaded weapons. They would have fixed bayonets. Uh, by the time they get within range, a lot of these guys are dead. So the idea, of course, is to survive this 100-yard dash. And uh, with fixed bayonets, or they would just use um, Stone Age man-style um, clubbing with their, their uh, musket, use it just like a huge war club as they charge into the ranks. So that's essentially how wars were fought in the Napoleonic era, in um, you know the, the up to the 1840s in the smooth bore barrel era prior to the introduction of rifling. It was often a ritual kind of process. The commanders would meet maybe the night before, they would select an hour, which they begin the battle. So um, as I say, it's, it's often almost uh, kind of the, there's a ritual aspect to it. Rifling. There you're looking at um, down a rifled barrel and this of course dramatically changes the nature of weapons. And this is why a musket becomes um, called a rifle. Uh, and it's an aspect of modern firearms to this day. Um, the rifling now, what it does is it grips the ball or the bullet as they'll become uh, known the conoidal kind of uh, shaped bullet that we're all familiar with. Um, the, the rifling grips that uh, munition and it begins to spin it um, along this kind of spinning rifle uh, path and uh, kind of like a, a football being, being thrown. It, the spin, first of all, gives it a greater velocity, gives it a greater stability and it dramatically increases the range of the weapon with the same amount of gunpowder. Um, it, in fact, it doubles the effective range now of, of the rifle. And 
you know, the difference between a hundred yard dash and a 200 yard dash, because the human body is finite is, is very, very, very uh, uh, different. So we know that, you know, the, the um, world's record for a hundred yard dash is nine seconds. So uh, let's say um, you're not a world record kind of runner, previously you would have to survive a run of a hundred yards maybe you can do it in uh, rather than world record nine seconds say in 15 seconds or 18 seconds it's it's doable 200 yards being fired at becomes less doable the um first of all the the bullet now has to be the size of the barrel um, in order for this rifling to work. So here is the Springfield model, 1861, uh, 58 caliber rifled muzzle loading percussion musket. That's the technical name for the standard rifle that Civil War soldiers will carry. Confederates will carry a similar weapon of the same caliber made in Britain, the Enfield um, 58 caliber rifle. It's the same weapon that Canadian militia will be carrying in the 19th century as, as, as well. But um, the Springfield model and the Enfield model um, rifles are very similar. 58 caliber, that's uh, 0.58 inches, the diameter of the bullet that is going down the barrel, or in fact, the diameter of, of, of the barrel. And 58 caliber is, um, that's a massive size. So um, again, for those of you who might be slightly familiar with, with arms, um, the caliber side is either expressed in millimeters or in inches. So um, a, th point, a, a 38, uh, for example, is 0 0.38 uh, of an inch in diameter. Um, a, a 50 caliber machine gun is, um, you know, still a heavy machine gun used Today, it's um, half inch in diameter, and, and a 58 caliber Springfield is, is um, you know, even larger than the 50 caliber uh, machine gun. Uh, Colt 45, for example, 0.45. So those are in inches. And, and then, of course, um, we have the European uh, model as well in millimeters. Um, a nine millimeter handgun is approximately um, equivalent to a 38 uh, caliber handgun in 38.38 in, in uh, inches. So uh, you do the math um, in, in, in terms of it, of, of, of millimeter versus inch, but the United States primarily um, uses the inch caliber designation. Here is the actual bullet that gets packed into the cartridge. It's known as, in the United States, they pronounce it the mini ball, um, but um, it's actually the Minier ball. Uh, Claude Minier, a captain in the French army, designs this uh, munition. And um, you can see, unlike a, a, a musket ball, this is a more traditional conoidal bullet-shaped um, munition that we're familiar with. Um, the bullet is um, 510 grains, approximately um, one ounce, and um, it uh, flies at a velocity of about 950 feet per second. Um, that's subsonic. Uh, it's, it's um, in other words, sound travels faster than the bullet. So it's a slow moving round, but at an ounce, 510 grains, it's a very heavy bullet that will cause all sorts of damage 
when uh, we begin to look for look at that, you know, the ballistics of it for specific reasons that were not intended. To give you some sense of um, how this bullet compares to modern ammunition, there again on the left, you see the bullet, 58 caliber Civil War bullet. Um, on the right, you see a typical military round that was carried by the U.S. Army or the Canadian Army, 5.56 millimeters or 0.233 inch caliber, uh, 5.56 equivalent to 0.233. So again, for those of you that know that um, 22 ammunition is kind of very light, plinking kind of ammunition, um, the size of the bullet of a 223 um, sorry, a, a 233 is slightly larger, but um, uh, you, you know, the cartridge here with the gunpowder is, is, is significantly larger than on a 22. Um, this, of course, is the business end right here, the, the tip. This is ejected by the rifle. So the, 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 when you get hit, um, compare this on the right to that on the left. The velocity is much more um, higher here. Again, you can see a 233 caliber, 5.56 millimeter carbine, standard military issue. The bullet is um, maybe 10% of what the Minet round weighed. It's a 55 grain bullet, one tenth of an ounce compared to one ounce for the um, Mene ball. The velocity of a round from one of these weapons is 3,200 feet per second compared to the 950 feet per second of the Mene ball. So it's um, traveling at a much higher speed and is going to have a lot more um, kind of impact velocity than the Manet round will, but again, it's much lighter. So again, it's the standard weapon here. You can see a cartridge actually being ejected um, as, as he had fired a shot and the cartridge will fly out of here and a new one will be loaded up. And of course, these weapons are fully automatic. They can fire um, in three uh, ways, uh, uh, well, two ways, fully automatic, you pull the trigger and you hold the trigger pulled down and it fires like a machine gun, it'll, it'll keep firing until you take your finger off the trigger or you run out of ammunition. Um, Semi-automatic, which is um, you pull the trigger once and it fires once and then loads a new bullet into the chamber. So um, it can fire as fast as you can uh, pull the trigger. Automatic weapons are illegal for ordinary citizens to have in Canada. And in some parts of the United States, you can have machine guns, places like Florida, Texas, um, but mostly in the United States, fully automatic weapons are difficult to, um, to obtain. Semi-automatic, as I say, pull the trigger once, it fires once. So again, you can see the difference in size of, of these two munitions. The other um, kind of standard military round is um, the kind carried in uh, the Russian AK-47 rifle. In fact, you're looking at um, Mikhail Kalashnikov for whom the AK-47 is um, named, the automatic Kalashnikov rifle, AK-47. This is the guy who invented it. And this is the standard arm of um, the Red Army, the Chinese Army of guerrilla groups in um, throughout the world, in Africa, in um, Asia. It's probably the most produced rifle, um, assault rifle in um, history. And it fires a, a much larger round, a 7.62 round um, that 
uh, travels at 3,200 feet per second. So um, uh, you can see it's it's it's. Um, Sorry, I um, fires a round at 2300 feet per second. So let me correct that. Um, fires around at 2300 feet per second. So it's a heavier round and it's slower than the uh, 233 round. course is a heavier round it could cause more damage and the russians as well they'll produce a, a very rare and um, only issued to elites 5.56.233 um, model of the ak-47 um, here you can see the difference between the two rounds this is again on the left 5.56 um 0.233. And here on the right, you can see the uh, 7.62 size round, which is approximately um, in American size, 30 caliber, kind of the American M1 World War II carbine would fire a uh, 30 caliber round. And there you can see a double A battery just to give you some idea of the size. Um, as I say, the Russians do produce a 5.56 type of um, AK-47. That's um, a rare type I carried in, in uh, when I wor was working in uh, Chechnya undercover, uh, embedded with rebel groups there as a, as a journalist. By then, um, in the 90s, everybody was killing journalists. So... Um, I declined to uh, kind of walk around without without a weapon. And, and that's a paratrooper version, 5.56. Again, much more accurate, much easier to fire, less recoil than you get on a 7.62. That has a bigger kick. And this one also came with a little, um, in Russian, it's called a mucha, um, a grenade launcher. Mucha means the fly. So you could let fly... Uh, let buzz, I guess, a small grenade out of this 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 device here. Here you can see some Chechen um, troops, guerrillas with various kinds of AK-47s, including child soldiers. And that's me there with um, my camera, kind of my major um, weapon that I carried. So the rifling, rifling now increases the range of these weapons. The um, effective range is essentially doubled to um, 200 yards. At 100 yards, the old 100 yards, um, you get 100% hit rates. You fire 100 shots from a rifle at 100 yards, you get 100 hits. Uh, very hard to miss. If it, Just if you have, you know, basic shooting skills. At 200 yards now, out towards Bond Street, it now has... 80% effectiveness. Uh, that's compared to back to the smoothbore, which had 80% at 100 yards. And, and, and so now soldiers have to survive that 200 yard range and more at 300 um, yards, it is 40%. And at 500 yards, 500 yards would be um, approximately from Dundas, Dundas and Young, all the way to that um, kind of retirement um, high rise just before you um, get to College Street. So that's um, still 40% effective. It's still relatively effective at 500 yards, and it can still, with luck 
or concentration of fire hit targets as far away as a thousand yards. And so the distance to uh, that would be from Dundas Street, just short of Wellesley Street. If you mass your fire, you could still hit something at um, 1,000 yards, the typical Civil War era rifle will penetrate a four-inch pine board. And so the challenge now facing soldiers, of course, is to survive this 200-yard final charge. Um, and, and, and this is where the army begins introducing calisthenics, they uh, begin, um, you know, physical shape, not just whether you have teeth or not, but whether you can run fast and be in shape enough and fast now become essential and will remain um, an essence in military basic training to this, this day, running and charging as fast as you can to survive these 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 attacks. So, and again, two hundred yards. Uh, you know, two hundred yards. We're talking about, um, uh, you know, drop dead effective range, but uh, up to, uh, you know, past Mutual Street, say five hundred yards. You towards Jarvis Street. You have to be able to run through that as well as, you know, it's not quite as effective in that distance, but they're going to get some, some hits. So soldiers still in that era are uh, trained, essentially drilled, not trained, I should say. They're drilled essentially to um, take fire over this distance and charge this distance. And they try to work out various different solutions for how to do this. Um, Winfield Scott's um, three-volume infantry tactics, which uh, was published in 1835 and uh, four times between the end of the Mexican War in 1848 and the beginning of the Civil War in 1861 had never been revised when the Civil War um, started. And, and many officers in both the Confederate and Union um, armies relied on Scott's 1835 infantry manual. Scott dictated uh, advances in close order formations, um, several ranks deep, separated by distances, as you can see in this um, illustrations. Um, the attacking units formed at intervals of 22 paces between each other. Infantry, as I say, were drilled to stay in line and in pace to maintain the close order formation by maintaining elbow to elbow contact during the advance. Uh, according to Scott's tactics, quote, the alignment can only be preserved in marching by the regularity of step, the touch of the elbow and the maintenance of the shoulders in a square with the line of direction, end of quote. The speed of attack was at first deliberate and uh, steady um, because of course, attackers would not come into the effective range of muskets until they come at least to 200 yards, the last 200 yards of um, attack. So Scott's manual called for a steady speed, so-called quote, common time, pace, which is 90 steps a minute of, quote, direct paces. These were 28 inches long, any faster, and the lines could not hold their uh, formation. Once they get closer to the enemy musket range, the attacking ranks now increase their step to quick time. That pace is 110 pace 
uh, 110 paces a minute. Once the attackers now fire their volley, they will now launch their final attack in double time pace, which is 140 paces a minute, charging with bayonets and, um, you know, using their muskets kind of as lethal clubs. This is an era where, where you know, helmets were um, not worn. This, of course, works when you had 100 yards to uh, charge in quick time and double time. At 200 yards, sides are taking casualties. And so Scott's manual is going to be supplemented by Major William J. Hardy's two-volume uh, rifle and Light Infantry Tactics, first published in 1855 when the United States Army uh, was adopting uh, rifles. Hardy immediately understood that to set lines of densely packed ranks of men advancing steadily over an in-range distance three times as long as before, under fire from quicker reloading and longer range rifles, firing a more deadly and crippling accurate inf ammunition is going to be suicide. And so what is Hardy's solution? What makes his manual different from Scott's infantry tactics manual? Well, um, when advancing, according to Hardy, through the last 200 yards of the kill zone, soldiers were instructed to run faster. Um, Hardy introduces a new pace, double quick time, 165 paces a minute, and the pace is increased in length now from 27 inches to 33 inches, and in the extreme circumstances, the double quick time pace is increased to 180 paces, double, double quick time. Hardy is, of course, recommending that troops be exercised um, in PT training, physical training PT. There um, as well are instructed when attacking that they, quote, should breathe as much as possible through the nose, keeping the mouth closed. Experience has proved that by conforming to this principle, a man can pass over a much longer distance and with lead f less fatigue, end of quote. So basically what they come up with is um, run faster, take bigger paces, and breathe through the nose. That's the best they could come up with. And so, of course, that's um, not going to particularly change casualty rates now as soldiers are getting massacred by these infantry weapons. Already in my description of how the um, a Virginian regiment of troops dressed in blue took out uh, Union artillery using rifle fi fire just shows you how lethal rifles are in um, even up against artillery. Uh, a rifle can take out the artillery gunners uh, before certainly artillery can mass enough fire to take out the riflemen. So the rifle now becomes the king of the battlefield. The um, troops also, they, they come up with um, variations on how to advance against a enemy. For example, uh, the so-called Indian rush, uh, they advance by alternating uh, bounds. Uh, one section will be firing, uh, giving cover against the enemy line, while uh, the other is uh, rushing forward to take position, then they open fire and give cover to the rushing line. The idea is, is to keep the enemy, um, you know, their heads down. The 
result, of course, often um, is that the defender is almost always at an advantage against the charge. Um, because first of all, often defenders will build barricades, they'll build breastworks um, behind which they will take cover. Um, they will reload their weapons behind the idea, uh, behind that barricade. The idea is, is to kind of maneuver your enemy to make a charge across a field that you force them to cross, a field that you as the defender has have prepared as well cut down trees cut down all the, the cover and and and, and bush moreover um, you can't reload these muskets while you're lying down say on your stomach you you have to be at least in a prone position in order to get um, you know to pack and load that that barrel through the muzzle the rifle has to be up in that position. So, so um, attackers are always attacking through this kind of um, open area and are often, again, exposed to this kind of fire without being able to reload. A lot of these um, attacks, the, 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 the main killing takes within 20 30, sometimes even less than that, 10 yards, five yards between enemy sides. Here you can see Pickett's charge at Gettysburg. And, and this literally was how close both sides came to each other. And then as well, in this case, you can see the Union defending uh, this attack have, have um, as well brought on um, well, actually, as I look at this, maybe I'm wrong. This isn't Pickett's charge as, as um, it's United States um, infantry that seems to attacking the Confederates here. <coughs> In any regards, you can see that um, as well, guns are brought up, um, our, our artillery, and they'd be firing, firing um, canister shot or grape shot point blank as, as, as well. But indeed, sides contact at this kind of distance. Sorry, here is Pickett's charge at Gettysburg. This is not unusual, the kind of rage, the, uh, the kind of range they're arriving at. And here again, going back to that photograph, you can see how the defenders have prepared their defense. Not only do they have the high ground here, but as well, they have this stone wall that had been, I guess, built there earlier, but they dug this trench along the stone wall over which they um, could defend Union infantry, which was coming up a hill here. And, and of course, um, you can see how many defenders have been killed here. Uh, but this is the winning side. If, if, if um, no photographs, I've never seen a photograph of what the attackers look like on the other side of this wall, but it, it wasn't going to be pretty. The, the Union would have attacked uphill um, on the other side of this wall for three days, and the Confederates here would have been massacring, massacring them. But again, you can see just how many casualties the defenders are taking, and they indeed they do have um, the advantages, advantage. So essentially, you know, we have centuries old tactics of, um, you know, soldiers in close order formation advancing at each other the way they um, did in the Napoleonic Wars, but the tactic has not caught up with recent new technology. So you still have kind of old think in new technological world think, future um, lag. Um, 